this sounds like drug addiction. This sounds literally like you just need something to give you a boost, then you're going to fall off, then you give a boost, which means your entire relationship with the religion is based on your emotional state. Alhamdulillah, one of the things I've been able to do behind the scenes is just engage with scholars personally and very unfiltered around the world. And by God, their criticism of their own institutions was worse than mine. They're not producing thinkers. Is this where you kind of see Bayina headed? My, the, the idea that I have in Bayina is that humanity deserves to have better access to Quran. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Prophetic Mentality Podcast. I am your host, Amr Mabrook, joined by my co-host Munir with a very special guest, Ustad Noaman Ali Khan. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. How are you doing? Alaykum assalamu alaikum. Welcome doing to well. Southern California. Alhamdulillah, it's good to be here. I wish we were able to host you uh, at a more sunny time, but uh, this is actually about as unsunny as it gets. Actually, look, if you look oh, outside right now, the sun is already out. <laughs> Not complaining. I like the rain. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have a very engaging discussion uh, about the Qur'an. So I'll let Munir take it over some of the questions, inshallah. Hi, Barakal Afiq Ustad. So I want to ask you, in Southern California, I have a lot of friends. We're on the Khatib circuit. Okay. But every now and then, we don't give a khutbah. And we have to go. And we, we will literally search all the masajid around us to see who's giving the khutbahs. And based on who's giving it, there have been mm. times where the options are so bad, we say to ourselves, all right, who's going to give a khutbah here on our campus, at work campus? So that we don't have to go hear such a bad khutbah somewhere else. Because um, it's gone to the point where every other week's a big miss. Where the the topic is either really poorly put together, you don't really understand the point, or its delivery is just so, so poor. Um, so we wanted to ask you, and, and I hear you have some left field ideas. So I'd love to hear what in your book makes a good khutbah or engaging khutbah, and especially considering the audience, if you're going to give one, what are you thinking about as you prep something? Okay, so... Let's dissect this problem. The khutbah at the end of the day is a minimal opportunity, 20 to 30 minutes maximum to communicate something, right? And it's not communicating something, in my opinion, it's not communicating something in a vacuum. This is something that people continually engage in throughout their life. So you have an opportunity to drip, release ideas and build something, even if you're not the regular khatib, but... By design, the khutbah seems to be something that uh, uh, nurtures something over time, right? To me, the problem isn't just a matter of style, like the, the speaker is monotonous or they're boring or whatever, or substance, or they didn't really say something profound. I think before style and substance, before that is actually thought process. Like what, what makes me want to give a khutbah? And to me... If you, uh, if you target, if you identify the objectives, one objective is you want to motivate someone, right? Which seems to be the most common sort of thing. I want to motivate someone. Um, and I, I'm, and we compare that to a reminder. I want to give someone a reminder equals I want to motivate someone. We've made this kind of subconscious equation in our head. The problem with that is motivation is a fleeting thing. Yeah. And we've become motivation addicts. So, so my problem now is youth come and say, hey, I really, I, I, I watch all these Islamic videos, I feel so motivated, and then I get unmotivated, and then, then, then I fall apart. And could you please say some words to motivate me? And this, and I look at it, and I was like, this is, this sounds like drug addiction. This sounds literally like you just need something to give you a boost, then you're going to fall off, then you give a boost, which means your entire relationship with the religion is based on your emotional state. Just it's Iman high, da, Iman high, Iman low. We, we like, use that term, Iman high and Iman low. Yeah, but if yeah. you just step back from the terminology for a second, it's just an emotional high and an emotional low. Yeah. And we're calling, we're giving it, we're dressing it up with prettier words. But actually what that means is we don't have a stable worldview on, predicated on which we build and you know, develop ideas, right? Yeah. So the more, my, my, this comes from my own bias, my own studies in Quran that are very much underway. Um, and I've, they've been underway for 20 something years, but now I feel like now I'm starting my study of Quran. One of the things that's emerging is the Quran really wants to develop a thought process. The Quran really wants us to think a certain kind of way. And the purpose of the khutbah for me is actually if motivation happens or inspiration happens, that's cool, but it's a byproduct. To me, and it's not even knowledge that I'm trying. And the second thing is knowledge. I'm going to give these people knowledge they don't know. I'm going to drop some knowledge on them. And knowledge to me, again, I'm going to use kind of almost dissecting language. It's just the delivery of information. 
right? And we're, we happen to live in the information age. So there's no shortage of information. So if somebody mm. wants information, they don't need to come to the khutbah to get information. Yeah. But this, this environment, people leaving their work, coming and sitting and concentrating, and then having this minimal time where they're, they know they're doing this as an act of worship to Allah, that mindset is something that needs to be capitalized on and then say, I'm going to give something that at the very least, I'll call it, it's food for thought. Like it's something that changed my perspective significantly or shift my perspective closer to the word of Allah in some way or the other. And the, the, the worldview of the Quran is essentially based on how we think about things like how we think about history, how we think about our behaviors. What are the core principles, core principles that are at play Whatever the situation is going on in the world, for example, somebody wants to comment on what's going on in the world, right? Uh, the go-to is let's let's find a story in the in our history that seems to correspond in some way and has some points of convergence with the events that are taking place. 100%. So if there's a war, let's tell a war story from history, mm. right? Or if there's a need to give, let's give a charity story, right? Because then the, the point is they're going to give charity. My problem with all of that is you're looking at the surface of the, the literature, the, the sacred word, yeah. you're not looking at the principles underlying it. And it's actually, once you understand the principles, they have universal value, and then they can apply to situation A, situation B, situation C, right there. Because I, 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 you know, Ghazai is on everybody's minds, for yes. example, right? And every khutbah, if you give a khutbah about anything right now, uh, the, the, somebody will come along and say, brother, you didn't give a khutbah about Ghazai, right? And even that, as unpopular as that may sound, May Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, secure Jannah for the shuhada of Gaza and give them, give, give them peace and prosperity and security and punish the people that are, that are doing the satanic things that they're doing to them. Amen. Amen. Right? Like, um, having said all of that, the issue is even on that, what's the mindset become? Well, unless I hear something about Gaza, that means the Ummah doesn't care. These leaders don't care. Right? Wait, wait, hold on. And then unless somehow it's tied in, to uh, and, and and I critically really try to listen to what's being said about the subject from an Islamic perspective, and what do you get? Uh, we're so helpless, we're so powerless. One day Allah will get them, and we have to wake up. Okay, and then when you keep hearing the Ummah has to wake up, everybody sitting there is like, yeah, the Ummah has to wake up. I'm already awake though. Mm, yeah. Like everybody else got to wake up. Or if best case scenario, somebody looks at themselves and says, yeah, I got to wake up. What does that mean? Mm. What I got to do? Like, I, I got to, what, pray more? What, what, do you, what, what, are you, what are you asking me to do? There's no, and, and maybe they're not capable of thinking in that way. Like, what am I supposed to do with this information, right? And that's, to me, the job of the khatib is to say, okay, let me nudge you in a certain direction and give you not just practical steps, but really thought through what does this look like? Right? And how does how does change happen? So this last khutbah, for example, I just gave khutbah uh, in King Fahd uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it was in fact about Gaza. And what I was talking about was, let's, you know, look, let's look at this disastrous tragedy, uh, this tragedy, and people look at this and say, how can Allah let this happen? Or what are we supposed to do about this? And I can't watch this anymore and all of this, right? Yeah. I say, okay, let's step back from this for a second and think about what's been happening to the, Mus the, the, the uh, Uyghur Muslims, the Uyghur Muslims, yeah. that is not showing up on your feed mm -hmm. uh, because TikTok is Chinese, right? <laughs> or let's, let's look at uh, what's been happening in Sudan or in, uh, you know, so many, uh, the list is very long, yeah. right? But we're, you know, when something, we see something, the Ummah is like, oh, this is intolerable, but it's actually happening all the time. And then let's take even a further step back. Okay, when it's atrocity to this level, it's it's inexcusable. But when you see uh, child abuse in your own country and you see homelessness and you see you see other forms of tragedy, it's not as extreme. So I can live with that. I'm okay with that. So are are we sensitized to some things and desensitized to others? And what does the Quran really want us to think about this? And, and let's look at tragedy in the seerah. Like, did the Prophet ﷺ not love humanity more than we could? Mm. Did he not love the believers more than we could? When he sees Bilal being tortured, is that not a state of emergency for the Prophet ﷺ? Right? And is he not, like, over gutted? And actually, the people that love him, that he loves the most, are the people that are torturing him the most and humiliating him the most? 
and the situation continuously escalates. So the Prophet is in an enormous amount of agitated state continuously for 13 years, continuously. But Allah seems to just keep telling him what looks at, sur at the surface like a passive, وَاسْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ Be patient over what they say. Ignore the ignorant. You know, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةُ كَأَنَّهُ عَلَى حَيْنَ Ayat on top, on top of ayat. Just let, it, let them be. Let them do their thing. Allah will deal with them. You just do what you got to do. Pray. Make this make this be in the night, in the mornings. And remember Allah, etc., etc. But then you have to step back and ask, why did Allah do that? Like, why why did He do that? Hindsight is 2020. You got 20, two decades, a little over two decades to change the world. And 13 years are going by and ain't nothing happening. And Allah is not even saying, by the way, pretty soon, I'm going to let you make hijrah and then you're going to build an army and you're going to take care of these people. Just wait until then. He's not telling him anything. He's not telling him. What, so when you think about that, what he's actually doing is he's cultivating a mindset. He's building a certain kind of um, maturity in the Sahaba that they're not going to react to the situation. They're going to build themselves no matter what. And it's the people that really were able to, that's why the parable in Surah Al-Fatih is about the crop that matured. <coughs> because when they're, they're so strong within, the, the simplest way, I don't want to ramble on with it because we've got so many things to talk about. But the simplest mm -hmm. way to put this is, Allah, Allah built a, a group of people that instead of the outside world impacting them, He was building people that whenever they are, they keep impacting the outside world. Right, so the, instead of being influenced, being reacting to situations, the, si the world they is they are acting in influencing situations. They're influencing so situations. The mindset, so, yeah. what would your advice be to someone who is reacting to the Gaza situation? I think there's an immediate reaction necessary, right? And uh, my own thoughts. This is not like Islamic, but this is my own analysis of the situation. Of I don't think Israel has Israel has been exposed um, the way that they have been before the international community. Uh, in their entire history. And the propaganda machinery has failed in a way that has, it n has never failed before. So the trillions that were put into this project have now crumbled. And, you know, and, and <laughs> this sounds sarcastic, but when, and maybe it's even politically incorrect, but when white people are, are, baff, uh, are appalled by something, then you know the world is listening. <laughs> right? Because the... the <laughs> It's true. <laughs> I, I'm I, if, if, like a, if like a white girl in college is crying about what's happening, then this must be serious. Because yeah. all the other colors of the world could be crying. They're crying every day. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> it's not a thing. Yeah, that means we've broken through all the, the we, barriers. Now you've broken through. Now, okay, now we need to we need to ban TikTok. We need to we need to have a congressional hearing about this because we can't have no white people be worried about this stuff. Because yeah. there's a, there's a threshold that's been crossed, right? Mm. And this is an unprecedented. I know that sounds racist, but actually. Let's be real. That's actually, Dave Chappelle has a joke like this about white people realizing police violence against African Americans. So it's 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 actually it's a thing. It's I don't think it's it's not racist to say. Yeah, it's just and an it's, observation. It's disconcerting to them. It's, yeah, and this yeah, is happening yeah, 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 in yeah. Europe. It's happening in America. It's happening in Canada. I was just talking to a university professor from LA. I was like, "What's the vibe on campus?" Like, I mean, you have non-Muslim students. What's the vibe? And he's like, "Oh yeah, Zionists are going crazy. That the Jewish students, quote unquote, Jewish students are feeling." Uh, they're feeling uh, like they're victimized. They're feeling scared. Yeah. All these, you know, from the river to the sea is yeah. genocidal um, speech and they feel like their life is threatened. So, yeah. And what, what the, the vibe he told me is nobody's saying it officially, but nobody's buying it. Like mm. everybody sees through it now. Yeah. Subhanallah. Nobody, so, so in that sense, continuing the noise on the subject, you think is a good thing? Is absolutely necessary. Okay. Like that's, if, the, if there's a weapon and you know it's working, Keep firing it. Oh, yeah. then, then don't stop. Then okay. don't stop. But, so. yeah, I think that's the point. Because yeah, first you kind of said you don't have to give an explicit khutbah on Gaza. And I think your very first khutbah you gave at this was uh -huh. you actually, I don't think you mentioned Gaza explicitly in the khutbah itself, like in the dua, of course. But because you were talking about Fir'aun and this, people who can think and can reflect, understand all the parallels necessary. But and I think that's the important thing. Like I don't mind a khutbah, going to a khutbah right now and they don't talk say Gaza explicitly. Fine. That's But by God, like make a connection for me, make some point where I, as an intelligent individual, can be like, oh, you know, I never considered it that way. Oh, that's what he's trying to turn my, I'm looking this way and he's telling me, just do a little nudge that way. Like, oh my God, that's what was happening yeah. really. That's, oh, that's how Allah addresses these and, things. And what was that, what, what I was doing in that khutbah was, I was in Australia and there's a lot of Muslims that have interactions with Christians all the time. Yeah. 
right? And I was like, okay, talk to them about the Pharaoh. Don't even talk about Gaza. Just talk to them. They love the Bible. Open up. Here's what he did. Yeah. Isn't, isn't this what he did? Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's think about that. Don't bring up anything. Let them make the neural connection themselves. Let them have the aha moment themselves. It's like you're like doing lead them to the water. They can't make them. You can't make them drink. Just lead them to the water and yeah. just yeah, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, ideas uh, will hold concrete better. If so, someone makes that connection themselves rather than being like, "This is what's happening." Actually, sometimes people have an aversion to to that. So, they so think so you're forcing someone on something on, on the subject of terrible khutbas. I'll <laughs> listen to a khutbah, and I'm not listening to the subject matter or the sub, the, the content. I'm looking at the worldview of the speaker. Mm. That's actually, I'm trying to find the source code. Why, why are they speaking in this way? Mm. Why are they putting their thoughts together in this way? This is how they see the religion. This is how they see Islam. This is how they see the world. And that's that's where these 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 really bad connections that they're making, that's where they're coming from. So now if I address, no, brother, you could have given a better example or you could have had a better conclusion or you could have motivated them to something more concrete. You're not actually addressing the problematic worldview that sits underneath all of that, yeah. mm. right? Which the Texans, Texans have the best sayings. That's what I call lipstick on a pig, right? So, <laughs> right? so that's, uh, you're, you're not really addressing the fundamental problem. So I think, and, and then I started really thinking about, this, is this just a khutbah problem? And I realized it's not. It's an Islamic education problem. And I, I wanted to kind of get a feel for myself of what's happening with Islamic education. And again, I, I, I've become a little more politically incorrect in some of the things that I think and say. So You've been in Texas a long time. It's yeah, I think, no, and the life experience, it just eventually you just learn to just, you know what, I'm going to say it like it is. So I decided, uh, my observation about America was a little bit, American, the American Muslim dynamic was a bit, it was formulating. And my, what does that mean, formulating? First, I was enamored by it, right? Where, mashallah, we're doing so much da'wah. We have these conventions. We have these, you know, these, these amazing things happening. And the MSA scene, the, you know, the, the, the da'wah organization scene, the educational institutions, the masjids that are being built. It's so cool, right? Mm -hmm. And the, we're so ahead of the Europeans because you, I've been to France. I've been to Germany. And they don't, they don't, they can't even dream of some of the things we're doing here, right? So it felt like we're, like, ahead here. And then... American speakers, Canadian speakers, Western speakers generally were open with, welcomed with open arms in Malaysia and Indonesia. And, mm -hmm. you know, you go somewhere, you're like royalty out there. And we're like, what? we must be thought leaders too, because they're like, what? Yeah. But then I, I, again, I like to step back and say, well, what's going on here? Right. And then I realized, so the, the, the young people that are uh, teaching Islam generally, I'm not pointing out at anybody individually, generally. When you it, say young, what do you, what age group are you defining that? Under fifty. Let's go. Let me let me be aspect. let me be <laughs> let me be very generous to myself and include my I'm forty five. So let me, let me, let me still feel young. <laughs> so it's beyond youth, but sure. So so <laughs> we go to learn from the Muslim world at some seminary, whether you end up in Azhar, Medina, some Deo, madrasa, Deoban, some madrasa. Yeah, okay. you went somewhere. Okay. Then you came back, and now you're basically teaching what you learned, but with an American accent with some, you know, hipster jokes here and there. Yeah. But basically you're regurgitating what you picked up there. Right. So, but then also what you're doing, not again, not individually someone, what you're doing also is you're, um, you're making it sound like a really fantastical romantic experience that you had when you were sitting at the feet of your shaykh and you were, he was dropping these flowers of wisdom and you were just noting them down. Subhanallah. The way and then you have these kids that have never seen that kind of an exotic experience. They're sitting there in the halaqa going, mashallah, the shaykh. Oh my God, this is so amazing. The knowledge. You know, and there's, there's this like, like this almost hippie thing going on. And I was like, okay, let me go to the source. Let me go to the madrasa where, you know, you, ex you exotically acquired these things yeah. and had this fantastical experience, you know, and let me just kind of talk to your teachers. Let me engage with them um, because I wanted to take my curiosity about the Quran further and further. And alhamdulillah, one of the things I've been able to do behind the scenes is just engage with scholars personally and very unfiltered around the world. And so I did that in the last couple of years. I just went to Islamic institutions and heads of madaris and just speaking to ulama. Mashallah. Right. And by God, their criticism of their own institutions was worse than mine. 
their and criticism of their own madrasa of system. their own madrasa systems mm. and how they're producing for lack of a better word they're not producing thinkers and the the whole system needs an upgrade and they're how producing it's, people that just regurgitate information they regurgitate than, and not only do they regurgitate they glorify that regurgitation as the only authentic way to bring islam to society so not only am I going to regurgitate this, this is the authentic right way. This cannot be challenged or questioned, right? And the top scholarship does. The top scholar, when you go to them, they're like, they're like, you're way cooler than all your students combined, bro. I mean, Sheikh, like how, how, does, how does this work? Well, it's, you know, the system's in place and now it's too late to change things or there's a bureaucracy in place, there's an expectation you're going to look a certain way when you come out. You're going to talk a certain way when you come out. Islamic studies came to a screeching, like as far as it's, 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 it pushing the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I'm limited. I'm limited in my space of uh, the work on tafsir, right? And so I became really interested in tafsir research, the history of tafsir research, how is tafsir being approached? That's where you've kind of just zoned yeah, in. Zoned in, right? Zoned so, in. Okay. so, um, and they have this, this concept of tajazzo, even in fiqh and ijazah, like you could be, you can be an authority in a juz of something, in a oh, piece of something. I never heard that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the classical fuqaha used to have these ideas that you have, you, you just did, um, you did your all your work on this one ayah. So you have an authority to speak on this ayah. Like a PhD in yeah. this ayah, that's it. Kind of like that, okay. right? So you don't have to be the know-all of all things, mm -hmm. which is the, the next problem I have is that a graduate from a particular school presents themselves as the representative of all of Islam and all of its intellectual heritage. Mm. Homie, that's a little too big for one person. For a five, six year degree, like there's no way. Even if it's a 20 year degree. The, and the people at the top realize, no, I have this corner in which I made some contribution, mm -hmm. but the ocean is way too big for me. But the, the, the lower tier grads are the loudest ones. And they're the ones that are, they speak in the most authoritative, like this is it kind of ways. Mm. And it's baffling to me. Like the, the intellectual arrogance, it just baffles me. It, it, it's confusing to me almost. One of these graduates, one time, he had, um, no institutions shall be named, no individual shall be pointed out. Came, but was a well-known scholar. And the people who don't really distinguish scholarship from scholarship, right? But well-known scholar. Came to my office. And he'll have one of my tafasir open on the desk. You go, so this is the one you get your things from. <laughs> And I was like, actually, no, on literary issues, when it comes to uh, uh, how ideas are progressing within a surah, I do read Islahi. But when it comes to Balaghi nuances, I read Ibn Ashur and Alusi. And then probably if they miss something, I'll go back further in Razi and Kashal. And then when it comes to the Athar, even though I start with Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, I'll move on to Qurtubi because I think he synthesizes things really beautifully from the Athari perspective. And I kind of started walking him through my library. And he goes, do you have a list? And I said, you're the alim. I'm not the alim. You're the, you're the sheikh. I'm, the, I'm just the guy. I'm just the research guy. And, it, and to, not to dismiss those that actually do the work, but what I've realized is the people who actually do the work are not that loud. They're busy. They're busy. They're busy reading with their nose in a book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's literally what it is. And so... And then sometimes I'll hear speeches and people will say things that like with such like pounding the podium and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, no, he doesn't. Actually, he really doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then after the talk, I'm not going to call him out on stage or even in public backstage. I'll be like, bro, you said this, but look at this, look at this, look at this. He goes, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's my point. Wow. That's kind of my point, you know. So I, I've become more hum, more humble to my own ignorance in Quranic studies the more I've moved forward. Like, even just studying Surah Al-Qiyamah, right? Yeah. This was new education for me. Like, every surah I take on now is just entirely, like, freshman. Yeah, you were here for a week. We were actually trying to get a hold of you earlier. And you spent the entire, I think you spent almost every morning reviewing before the three-hour dars at night. No, I, 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 so, I, my study of Surah Al-Taghabun ended almost a month ago. I've been studying Surah Al-Qiyamah full-time at least six hours a day. I've been studying Surah Al-Qiyamah since that time. And then when Quran week started last yeah. week, I got here and I was up at Fajr. My parents were with me. Um, I was up at Fajr. And my nieces and nephews were here too. And I wanted to play with them, but I couldn't because <coughs> Surah Al-Qiyamah. So from Fajr until Asr, 
I was basically buried. And then I would just drive off to the masjid to do the dars. Yeah. And that was my life for the last week. So you're like, did you see California? I was like, no, I just, I just saw my laptop and my books. That's hope, all I saw. I hope you were in a nice hotel. Uh, <laughs> was, was air, we experimented well, with an well, Airbnb well, this, this time. Topic, though, it, it's a good transition. When you approach the Quran, so I, I guess, you know, you've been made famous, quote unquote, through your, how you present the Quran to people, especially English speaking audience. Because we're not used, because you're right, there are a lot of Adam scholars in other languages who do hit these same beats. Yeah. I think in English, we were really divorced from that. We're just yeah. so used to thou art XYZ language in our uh, translations. Yeah. So people felt really disconnected. So you came and you have, and you, you and your team have developed like these five lenses of how you approach the Quran when you try and do something from scratch. Like, all right, I'm going to come to Surah Qiyamah, brand new, yeah. as if I've never read this before. Can you walk us through? I'm going to put, I know language is one of them. I'm going to put that last because it'll transition to other things. Yeah. But to go through them, one of them you call it Quranic worlds. What does that mean? Like, are you looking at a surah? So, okay. So, uh, where you got that from, but that series I did with Dr. Suhaib and Fahim on the five lenses of contemplating the Quran. Yes. I'd like to give you a preface to that. Please. And the preface to that is uh, what is the difference between tafsir and contemplation? Right. And this is a really important distinction that every Muslim should know. The objective of tafsir is very simple to not misunderstand what's being said. If you just take that as the axiom, the purpose, the objective of tafsir is to make sure you're not misreading what's being said. Mm. So, and therefore, you know what the word means, you know what the context is, you know what the, what the pronoun, who the pronoun is referring to. If it's talking about Pharaoh, you're not thinking it's talking about Abu Jahl or something. You didn't mix people up, right? So you're, you've, you've got your information right. To give you a parallel, it's like you heard something on the news. The objective of tafsir is investigative journalism. Make sure you got the accurate report mm -hmm. on what this actually was, right? Now, now that you have the accurate information, now let's think about that information. That's tadabur. So tadabur is the next step. Yeah. Now, the problem with translation of Quran is sometimes the translations are missing elements of accuracy. Sometimes they're missing elements of context. So your, your starting point information is sometimes lacking. Right? So now if as an average Muslim, I'm trying to contemplate the Quran on top of something that's already lacking, mm -hmm. then I'm building an entire narrative on something that may, I may have not even understood properly to begin with, which can be very problematic. And that mm -hmm. happens all the time. So the, and the, the thing with our, our learning institutions was, Let's make sure we teach our students proper tafsir. But then there was no discussion about how do you take tafsir and actually do what is supposed to be done, the mm -hmm. So the, the Quran, when it, the Quran keeps talking about how it's clear, right? And why don't you understand? You could think of that as pointing us towards tafsir. Mm -hmm. And when it when it says, why don't you think deeply? Why don't you contemplate? Why don't they contemplate? Are their hearts locked? That's the dabur. Now that's where these five lenses come in. Gotcha. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and is tafsir for everyone? Is like I'm at college campus and I know Bible studies, they get together and they talk about the Bible and a passage together. Can me and my MSA sit down together and do our own kind of Quran discussion about ayat of the week? I think we're reductionist when it comes to the subject. I think we didn't think carefully enough about how do you educate different kinds of different groups of people uh, with the Quran. Like the Quran itself came over a period, gradually educating people, right? So, and Allah didn't give people something more than they could handle in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at that as a philosophy of the Quran itself in the way that it brought transformation to society to begin with, is it really healthy that we want just everybody to consume everything about the Quran in tafsir or even just contemplate the entire Quran? No, I think there should be uh, strategic approaches. Let's really take our time to understand the Fatiha, for example. And I, I do, th I, I genuinely believe, I've made my case for this in different lectures. You you, you know the heavenly order. I've even added some things to the, the, the fundamental arguments. I do believe that the Quran's order is a curriculum designed by Allah. The order of revelation or the order of reading? The order as we have it now. Okay. Yeah, that, that was, that has its own purpose. The order of revelation had its own purpose and it was a timed purpose. So it's not maybe applicable. No. Okay. And the, the purpose, the timeless purpose is met by this. And which is a discussion by itself. But simply speaking, the Prophet talks about two kinds of stories. The uh, Quran talks about two kinds of stories. Stories of prophets and stories of nations. 
And if you think about the main nation that carried the uh, prophets that delivered revelation and nation that a nation that carried revelation. Okay. So the prophets that delivered revelation are like Nuh, Salih, Shu'aib, Musa, etc. And the, the nation that carried revelation is the Israelites. Okay. The Quran gave the Prophet in the seerah the blueprint for what to do in line with what the previous prophets had done in their missions. That was in the order of revelation. That was the blueprint for his mission. This ayah is needed in this situation. This ayah is needed in this situation. So he can take the next step in his mission. Sallallahu alayhi wa When that mission is complete, we're no longer a mission. We are now a nation. Mm -hmm. Right? And now we need a new educational approach. The educational approach required for a nation. And the curriculum for that is the order of the mushaf. So from then on, as uh, the Ummah curriculum is Fatiha Tanas. And so to me, instead of saying, well, should anybody just open up the Quran? This is the ad hoc Google, YouTube, chat GPT kind of approach to the Quran. I say there should be an entire campaign, Fatiha and Baqarah. Everybody should be engaging with Fatiha and Baqarah, even if it takes them a couple of years. If it's a college campus, if it's a, you know, a podcast, if it's whatever, let's understand Fatiha and Baqarah. Let's get our, our bearings because it's building a narrative. It's building a thought process. It's building a worldview. It's actually building a sense of self. Um, look at why are we on this planet? The story of Adam. Chosen above all other creation. Within that creation, when they populated, among all of those sub-creations that were chosen, a nation gets chosen. That's the Israelites. That's the second story. Why were they chosen? Because they're children of a very specially chosen man, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Mm. And they failed in their responsibilities of being models as a nation. So Allah decided to give his final messenger, his ummah, so they could be models for the rest of the world. Now you see your place in the world starting from Adam all the way to yourself. That's what Baqarah does. In a, actually, if you step back, <laughs> look at Baqarah, mm -hmm. right? So what I'm saying is, should students engage? Yes. Should they be asking questions? Should anybody be reading the Quran and saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? Yes. Because when you ask what this means, you're actually looking for tafsir. You're mentally engaging. You're mentally yeah. engaging. And it's giving you, and the Quran, I will I believe Allah did this on purpose. I've experimented with non-Muslim friends. Here, read it. Tell me what you think. Man, I got questions. What does this mean right here? What does this mean right here? The Quran, Allah designed it that somebody engaging it will have questions. Mm. Like they'll be hit by some things, confused by some things, curious about some things, you know, and Allah wants to capitalize on that curiosity. So they will go to a believer and say, tell me what this means. And the more they learn, because, the, you know, even the Quran says, there was a process behind that, right? Um, in a different context. But like, that's the, 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 the mechanism that was supposed to be in place. We didn't put that in place. In fact, places that we glorify as places of knowledge, uh, like in South Asia, for example, mm. the common narrative among Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi Muslims is you shouldn't read the Quran, you'll get misguided. Did you know that that's the most common sentiment towards the Quran? You should not read the Quran in meaning. Read it for barakah, read it for this, read it for that. But if you read it by yourself, are you reading translation? The Imam will come and tell you, don't do that, you will be misguided. Right? What? The yes, and, <clears throat> and hundreds of millions of Muslims believe this. Can you imagine the impact on the Ummah that that has had? Right? So oh, wow. that does and, and on the on the extreme end is what you're saying in the Bible study approach. Well, the ayah says was Shamsi Waduhaha, but I feel like a Shams is talking about LED lights <laughs> and how they like, you know, you can change the <laughs> I, I, can feel, I can get the sentiment of uh, the Southeast Asian. I, I think what they were doing was trying to prevent the other end. Right. Like they're saying, if you go, you'll start doing this. You'll say, right. the sun is the LEDs. Right. So I, I understand where that was coming from, but now you've messed up the worldview of an entire generation because now they're like, I can't engage it at all. Then give the alternative because that's the issue. Yeah. And the alternative is, oh, just study the ilm. My problem with that overly simplistic answer is if I open up Ibn Kathir, mm -hmm. uh, Rahimahullah's tafsir. And I say, okay, I'm just going to read this. This is this is what I'm going to rely on. Very common English translation, uh, uh, you see. Are you though? Are you though? Because we 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 say things very simplistically. Oh, the most reliable tafsir is this. Yes, it's a remarkable tafsir. Are there issues in that tafsir? Yeah, yeah, totally. I'll give you an example. We say the earliest tafsir are the most authentic. 
and the earliest opinions are the most authentic, great. You want to hold on to that? Let's see how that plays out. Allah says in the Quran, uh, any any ayah of da'wah, okay? Ud'u ila sabili rabbik, and you know, um, for example, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ Right? وَهَذِهِ بَصِيرِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَنِتَّبَعْنِ Many places in the Quran call to the path of your master. This is my path. I call it to, to it with insight. Or, you know, um, who's better in speech than someone who calls to Allah. Calling to Allah, calling to Allah, calling to Allah. In very early opinion, look this up yourself. I won't name the tabi'i. But the, one of the earliest opinions is, oh, all of these ayat are abrogated. Because the surah of fighting came. None, none of the ayat are ever applicable again. And this is recorded in classical books, including works of Ibn Tafsir, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah. Would you literally go up there and give that as, okay, you know, I'm going to give the authentic tafsir of this ayah. Would you, would you endorse that? Because I don't even believe that to be correct. I would challenge it. And I have challenged it with scholars. And I said, do you accept this opinion? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a classical opinion. I was like, yes, but do you accept this opinion? And what are your evidences for accepting? Because I'll give you my evidences for rejecting it. Right now, we'll have those conversations. Or for example, we are so proud of saying, you know, Islam says, la ikraha fid deen. There's no compulsion in religion. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Do you know? I mean, we use that as one of our like, yeah. mantra, that's a Western, mantra, that's yeah. a Western uh, Muslim tenet of faith, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and, and the, the uh, <laughs> many classical works, it's, uh, it's abrogated. Yeah. And that's highly problematic. How can, to, to me, even the, the subject of abrogation is a topic by itself, but like, yeah. Uh, we overly glorify classical works as if everything was figured out, right? Many things were figured out. Many things left us with more questions and scholars came after to try to address those questions and it kept building and building. If everything was figured out in a particular book, there was no need for additional work, right? But uh, the volumes and volumes that have been written in Tafsir have been done for a reason. Not just because somebody just decided, I'm going to do what's already been done, they were all thinking, I need to do something that hasn't yet been done. There's more needed here, right? That's a miracle of the Quran. You can have 1,400 years of scholarship, many, many tafsir, and every time someone is finding out a new understanding or figuring out something new, and it's, we're nowhere near exhausting it. This will keep no. going on until the end of time. No, and then yeah. and the, 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 the fact of the matter is, I, you know, I went to Pakistan, one of the tr most tragic things, we have millions of hufaz. MashaAllah. And went to Madaris and I said, where's the, I not the Qur'ani. Like, is there a Qur'an specialization in this madrasa where they cover the entire Qur'an and they probably, no, we don't do that. Oh, it's just. Right. I was like, is there any other madrasa in Pakistan that is that? These are the Alamiya programs. Is there any other madrasa that has a takhassus in the Qur'an? No. No, we don't know. I found one in Northwest province, very obscure in Northwest province where they, they teach tafsir and the book actually. It was really cool. But overall, No. We just read Tafsir Jalalain and we move on. Jalalain is one of the most concise commentaries on the Quran, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't go into any details. And genuinely, if you're studying it, if, you're, if your mindset is, that's the answer, now I know. If that's your answer, that's your attitude, you'll get a lot out of it. If you're going with an inquisitive mind, you're going to come out with more questions than answers. Is right? it like a very surface level? It's just like synonyms. Like Allah said this, the synonym is that. Allah said this, the synonym is that. Uh, yeah. Or some, some context in yeah, some cases, some sub of Nuzul in some cases. Okay. But um, I, uh, uh, what I re find really exciting that's happening in the Muslim world, in the world of scholarship now mm -hmm. in Quranic studies, is there's this really incredible curiosity into the text. And there's really digging deep. You're seeing the resurgence now. of this is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's happening in Islamic universities around the world. And it's really cool. It's really cool to just even, for, <coughs> I feel like, I'm not at the front of this. I'm in the back seat, just a spectator, and I'm getting a glimpse of some of these amazing things that are happening and picking them out and you know engaging with some of them. It's really cool. I think this can pivot into our next topic about Bayina. Um, sure. Yeah, like is this where you kind of see <sighs> Bayina headed, kind of engaging in these like, quote unquote cutting edge research or development of these methods or discussions or interacting with these institutions in this way? Like, where do you see this going? Where do you see Bayina I have, going in this I way? have a sort of a bigger picture thing with, with Bayina. So, so my, the, the idea that I have in Bayina is that humanity deserves to have better access to Quran mm. and to engage with Quran in the way that Allah intended it. Okay. Right? I'm not saying even after doing a lifetime of work that I'll have the right answers about what the Quran actually means. I'm, I'm going to do my effort, but that's not... My mission isn't they should learn what I have to say. My mission is the pathway to engaging with the Quran and exploring it 
in a way that Allah intended should be initiated and should be rejuvenated, right? Now, what, what that means is at the highest level, it's cutting edge research, whether it's the cross section of Quran and biblical studies or history mm -hmm. or the humanities and all kinds of things. Now, we'll talk about the contemplation, uh, yeah. you know, some of the elements, like you said, the world of the Quran, yeah. right? Uh, but underneath that is the Quran needs to be presented in language that university students can understand if they're not the seer students. Underneath that is the Quran needs to be presented to teenagers in language they can understand without them feeling like they're being subjected to some old people conversation. Hmm. Underneath that is kids need to be engaged. Underneath that is, you know, like uh, preschoolers need to be engaged in the Quran. And, some, and if you work forwards, how do I build up a kindergartner and I have a plan for a kindergartner that by the time they come out of high school, they have a Quran-inspired worldview and they have a pretty good grasp of what this book is about. And they're really passionate about continuing to explore the, the treasures of this book for the rest of their life. Like that, how do I do that? What's, what, you know, I have these 11 years to do this with a kid that he just, in his, in his or her adulthood, they're just, you know, they're just diving into the Quran for its richness their entire life. And exploring its meaning. So a worldview building curriculum. Yeah, a Quranic worldview building. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. and but if the the thing I experienced, um, you were in the full time dream program, and um, again I'm unfiltered in this for some reason. I okay. Just, so I really wanted people to learn Arabic so they can get into Quranic studies, but Quranic studies at that point was my personal venture. Like I was engaging in, I couldn't figure out a system for it. Like how do I systemize the study mm -hmm. of the Quran? So a lot of my students. They studied Arabic with me, and then they went on to do Islamic studies elsewhere. Yeah. But a lot of those Islamic studies institutions were byproducts of institutions that are already in the East, which I already told you have many fossilized approaches to curricula. Right. So they, they, they're learning beneficial Islamic sciences, but they're not pushing the boundary to, and it's certainly not Quran centric. Right. It's, it's not like uh, you're going to go to an institution, and by the time you come out, you have this really deep, beautiful grasp of the Quran, what you mostly have is a really good understanding of fiqh, you have a pretty good understanding of hadith issues, you have a pretty good understanding. Other subjects get a lot of attention. The Quran gets ceremonial attention. I told the alim in Pakistan, the only subject in Islamic studies is that the yatim is Quran. <laughs> like, the, we replace Quran with hifz, and we call it we're learning Quran. That's not learning Quran, that's learning the sounds of the Quran. That's not the Quran. You know, Quran is a message. So that that it didn't get the attention that I was hoping it deserved. Wouldn't wouldn't you know someone argue that <clears throat> if someone is studying fiqh and hadith and tafsir and you know Arabic, that's all tied to the Quran? Yeah, it's the same. Like as they're all pulling from those sources and engaging with the Quran to maybe understand what this hadith means or you know pull out a fiqh ruling, right? Like that's kind of man. That'll all, be that'll be six other podcasts, but I'll tell you. I'm just saying at a surface the, level, you know, at, at surface I'm trying to give, I'm trying to give the, 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 the benefit the, of the doubt. No, just the other, the other side the of the argument. The other side of the, the, other argument, side of the, the argument, side of the argument they, they were supposed to have been inspired by the Quran, mm -hmm. but they went down such rabbit holes that when I sit with Fuqaha and say, you have this us asl, where did this asl come from? I really want to understand this asl and how it developed. And then we try to trace it back. And it's the path is so obscure sometimes. Going back to the origin, I was like, what happened to it being Quran? It's like you're saying that. the asal is like from this person to this person to this person. Like they have right. a chain, and that, but it's this not. This is maybe. why I've become a huge fan of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. I'm like, I'm just fascinated by this man. I think, uh, I'll say this without a filter. I think he's one of the most, if not the most lied about uh, luminaries of Islamic history. Lied about? Yeah, lied about. Yeah. Yeah. And what? <laughs> he's he's misrepresented. And by whom? Everybody. People don't <laughs> study him. It. Yeah, yeah. Wait, I would. I will boldly uh, say this. I will boldly say Abu Hanifa rahimahullah is misrepresented. Oh, he didn't have controversial. He, 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 he <laughs> didn't have enough access to hadith. He didn't know this, this, this. He like people <clears throat> try to kind of you know how you like softly try to undermine someone. Yeah, there's a lot of soft undermining of Imam Abu Hanifa. And if you actually study his history and his record and his output and what he's the grandfather of all things fiqh, right? There's a reason for that. And I'll leave you curious for that. And I'll point you to some people that can help you with that one. But <laughs> I tell you, he, we need to rediscover this man. He was onto something. 
Well, you chose the right method. I'll give you that. Yeah, it was. Wait, you're Hanafi, right? I'm, 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 I call, I identify my question. No, 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 not at all. I I identify myself as early Hanafi. Early Hanafi. Yeah. I've never heard of this before. Well, now you have. (laughs) Now you have. I I identify myself as early Hanafi. I love. Actually, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole. It's a lot of good ass. Oh, boy. Back to the Quran. Back to expertise, as you're saying. But but, but it is tied to the Quran. Because Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, had a profound Quran-centric worldview that informed his entire fiqh. And it was it's so appealing if you study it. And if you look at his thought process, it's incredible. It's I feel like it's ironclad. It's incredible. I'm so... And the, the, the person that I put next to him... And like to complete is Imam Malik. Like these two? Killer. Man, killer combo. Is, that's, a, that's a killer combo. <laughs> that's a killer combo. Uh, anyway, let's, let's yeah, back. Yeah, we can be brief about this because we yeah, have yeah. another topic to broach. But yeah. I do want to ask. So now, okay, I'm in a tafsir thing. I'll have some yeah, young professionals. We want to come and sit down, talk about the Quran together. So open up. We have uh, Mike Sheikh told me like this, this uh, translation is very good. has all the right commentary. So you know what the information is. You Got know it. what the context is, has the right footnotes. The translations are like pretty darn good. Okay, now I'm sitting with my group and we want to read these ayat together. We're going to read these 10 ayat together and we read them and we want to reflect on it. Yeah. How would you tell them to approach that reflection process? There's so much you can do with that. And um, one of the things you can do after the tafsir homework, yes. like you said, is what I call the world of the Quran. And the world of the Quran is um, the Quran is calling upon something. The, the, the Quran is commenting on something and it's to really understand it you have to put yourself in it you have to enter it mm-hmm. so for example uh, Allah is talking about you know the pharaohs Pharaoh spoke Pharaoh said this yeah I need to study some ancient Egyptian e- Egyptology I want to know what the pharaohs were like I don't I want to know how they dressed mm-hmm. what their courtroom looked like what is, is it what what can I gather about the pharaohs I want to put myself in the Pharaoh's court. Yeah. Right? Allah is talking about <clears> winds. <throat> right? When I was studying Surah Dariyat, I spent two weeks, uh, I think, looking at winds, uh, papers on wind and how wind works and how, because Allah says they, winds carry. It's like, what are they carrying? Okay, they carry clouds, but Mufassir mentioned they carry clouds, they carry dust. It's like, how do they carry dust? I didn't know that, you know, volcanic ash from around the world can end up like you could be you can have you can have sand from the Sahara go ends up in Southern America it ends up in the, uh, the beach of Florida yeah like mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> right so like um, and it then it gives you a new meaning to the ayah wherever you may be Allah will bring you back because I'm gonna die my body's gonna decay part of my body's gonna become dust particles and they're gonna fly all over the place. They're going to be everywhere eventually. Allah says, wherever you may be, he'll bring you all back. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. <laughs> like it just, so your, your contemplation on what Allah is saying gets so heavy mm-hmm. when you decide to stop and think about the world he's inviting you to explore. Mm. Like this most recent one that's on my mind is Surah Al-Qiyamah because I just finished it. And Allah said the guilty conscience. He, he swore by the guilty conscience. And nafs al the self that blames. Yeah. I said, I can't, I can't understand the guilty conscience until I understand conscience. And I can't, I can't understand conscience until I study conscience. So I started studying conscience. I looked at conscience from the Islamic perspective, the Quran, the historical perspective, mm-hmm. the theological perspective, the Christian Jewish perspective on conscience. Then I looked at the philosophical perspective on conscience. Then I looked at postmodern conscience discussions. How does how does Freud describe describe conscience? How how were uh, uh, philosophers pre um, or scientists even pre uh, um, quantum physics def- des- describing consciousness, and how are they describing it post? How are uh, how are evolutionary biologists describing consciousness? And I'm just looking at this entire spectrum, and I'm thinking, how is the Quran responding to this? How is the Quran responding to all of this? Mm-hmm. Right? And I read some amazing books on the subject written by Muslim intellectuals. That were just absolutely mind blowing stuff. Give, right? give us one. My favorite one: Ideology of the Future by Muhammad Rafiuddin blow your mind it will blow your mind book was written between the 40s and the 50s and you would think it was written yesterday it was was just next level stuff but anyway so it took me down into that world the Mm. world of conscience Mm. and because 
Allah put that at the onset. It's called Bara'at Istihlal in Balagha, like a, a grand opening. The surah has a grand opening where he took two grand ideas, Yawm al Qiyamah and Anafs al Lawama, and now the rest of the surah, right? So it's, it's like those two ideas are echoing throughout so this, the surah. This is where you would like really benefit from expertise in subjects, like where you have the guy, when you're talking about anything that do bio, biology, the guy who's a doctor starts giving you X, Y, Z. That's thing, right. And the guy who's a civil engineer says, oh, like my dad, he, he was reading the end of Surah Al-Mulk. Allah uh, says, the water will go down and you won't be able to bring it back out fresh. And he's like, when I was younger, I was like, eh, we can put wells and drills and whatever. It's not a big deal. But he's in water irrigation. He's like, oh yeah, you can't get it back fresh though. If it goes down, you're, you you lose that. Like you're going to have all this. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, oh yeah, that now makes total sense why Allah said it that way. As opposed to just saying like the water goes away. See, an yeah. engineer would see that and you wouldn't, you yeah. and I wouldn't see that. The same way I was talking about, um, it was yeah. Surat, al, uh, Surat Al-Najm. And I was talking about it in uh, in Dallas, and there was actually somebody who works in uh, neurology, and he, he works in genetics, mm. and they had done a lot of research on the something within the genome that I, I'm going to butcher this because I have no background, but basically there's some kind of a capsule we all have in our in our cells that's the death gene, and it it starts slowly releasing, and that's part of how death starts happening slowly. You also have like the DNA us. strands, the telomeres at the end, they get shorter over time. Yeah. So like the DNA is like so dying out. There's research on how to keep it from yeah. releasing so that we can have longevity and yeah. not die, basically. Yeah. Right. And every time they try to mess with it, it expedites death. Subhanallah. So how, <laughs> so, the door's box, yeah. they open it and up I, and just because it works. I, I couldn't have known that. And he yeah. comes and he, you know, he tells me. And then I, you know, there was another really interesting Ala comes from Ilya. And it's in Surah Najm to Fabi Ayi Ala Irabi Katadamara. Right? Ilya. Something and Ilya is the, the joint of the thumb. Mm. Is Ilya. Okay. And from it came etymologically came the idea of doing something unique that nobody else has done. Came Ala. And uh, a couple of people that were doing evolutionary biology, like the opposable thumb yeah. actually allowed us to grab tools in ways that no, nobody else. Good. And it's Allah is drawing that parallel and saying Allah does things that nobody else can do. Oh, very interesting. SubhanAllah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, for the sake of time. So if people want, there's a playlist online that you can go through these like in much more depth. Yeah. But I do want to like to, uh, for the sake of time. The next one was personal experience, which yeah. I think kind of speaks to itself where you live life and something traumatic happens. So for example, um, I cannot understand what it's like to put my child in a basket down the river if I don't have a kid or if I'm not a mom. Like I will not, it won't hit me the same way. Right. And even a woman. So she's like, she reads it when she's younger. She says, okay, that's interesting. Oh, it's tragic. Then she has a kid and she reads the eye about Musa's mom throwing in the river. And like, oh my God. Now she might start crying in a way I could never connect. With right. Her. Right. Or she has a memory of her son almost drowning in the swimming there pool or something like that. Yeah. Right. And it hits her very differently. Um, so there are experience. And again, because Sutul Qiyama is in my head, um, so much study of, the language, the etymology, the tafasir, the extra Quranic literature, like I just referred mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it all, Allah says, Human being has full view of themselves, no matter how many excuses they cast out. I can be defensive about myself, but I know, I know my dark places. I know my mistakes. And I, you know, the world doesn't have to see them, but I know them. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest with myself, right? And it's like this really stark look in the mirror when you're reading Surah Al-Qiyamah, right? And uh, the, 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 even this, this image of, uh, you know, people are, people are dying, people are crying for you on Judgment Day, begging, can we find a doctor? Can we find somebody to chant something on this person? Qila man raq. Qila suggests that it's not the person, because that would have been qala man raq. Mm. Allah says qila man raq. It will be said. Could have been said by him, the person dying, but it's being said by their loved ones, everybody. Yeah. Right? It could even be the angels are saying it in a sense, who's gonna help you now? Like it's being said by the angels. Mm -hmm. You still think you can get a doctor? Mm -hmm. It's almost like that. So it has multiple layers, right? But on judgment day, when he says Ain al Mafar earlier on, yeah. he doesn't say Waqila Ain al Mafar. He says, Yaqulul insan The human being will say, Where's the escape? Yeah. Nobody's asking for how you can escape. Nobody cares about you then. Mm. Like there's a contrast drawn between when a person's dying, everybody's crying, and they want this to they want to be they want to save them, and when a person's resurrected, nobody cares, and they have to run for themselves, right? And you just think about that, you know, because uh, you know my sister passed a few years ago, and we were all devastated as a family, right? And we even up up until the moment of 
her death, just the weeks leading up to her death, just looking for the doctor, looking for a specialist, looking for, some, we need a second opinion. We need this, we need this, we need this. And just to ponder for a moment that that same beloved sister of mine, one day when she's resurrected, I'm resurrected, I'm going to act like I don't know her. She's going to act like she doesn't know mm -hmm. me. You know? And my, my parents that literally go visit her grave every week, every week they go without fail. And they stand there and they cry. And a day is coming where there's no tears being shed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just, to, the, just to even be able to process that is so overwhelming. You know? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Allah Akbar. Allah mercy on her. I mean, yeah, um, the third one, this is where I come in, uh, connections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is, and you've kind of, uh, it's been made more popular in the past, like maybe 100 years. Yeah. Um, and there's an older study, this is old that, the tafsir of looking at ayah by ayah, like, oh, how does this idea go to the next ayah, to the next ayah? Because mm -hmm. in English translation, especially, things are so jumpy. Like, Allah was talking about war, and then he talked about riba, and then he talked about this. Like, yeah. what, what's going on? Mufassir has always spoken about line to line in a, in order. You see that in older tafsir. Not always, mm, only, but, only two main ones. Ra I think of Razi and uh, I don't know the other one. Razi and Biqai. Biqai. Razi and Biqai. But some of them, some here and there, they might, might mention it, but for the most part, no. Yeah. So just to say that it's not like unprecedented. Right. Where they're, they're talking about connections like that. But then now, Slahi, especially in the past century, have really looked at it like holistically. And especially centering on a surah. So as opposed to saying right. this ayah, I could have put, Allah could have put it in any surah if he want, hypothetically wanted to. If you right. were to say they all mean the same thing. Oh, Allah said it there, here. It means the same thing. Right. So I'll put it in this surah, in this box. So you need to contemplate in this box in the context of, he could have put it in ayah earlier. He could have put it in ayah later. Right. He could have put it at the very beginning. Could have put it in the conclusion. So why... Uh, why this that. way? Yeah. yeah. So why is that significant? Let me ask that even. Uh, to make the long discussion short, I would say that every the way I view a surah and the way I think your audiences can really grasp the subject is by uh, by an analogy. Um, Allah is al musawwir He's a he's the painter. He's the depictor. He's artistic. Mm -hmm. So he didn't just deliver a message to us that has uh, quantifiable information. God is one. There's a judgment day. He he de he depicted that information artistically. Right, so the surahs are a depiction of how artistically he delivered his message. So there's a beauty to the Quran for that reason. There's a rhythm to the Quran for that reason. Now, if you think of architecture and so you, kids, you give them each the same hundred uh, Lego pieces, the same hundred config, mm -hmm. and say, "Build, build me something." Their creativity will lead them to build something entirely different. Yeah. Right. Uh, when you walk into a building, a gorgeous building, you're going to look at the arches. You're going to look at the the window design. You're going to look at you know, especially in old ancient building where there's a lot of handicraft, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was going on in the mind of the of the maker, how the light will pass through this place, et cetera, et cetera. Every surah is like a palace, Allah's pal one of Allah's palaces you've entered. And every there's attention to detail. And just like every brick is put in the place, actually the, the most beautiful depiction of that in the Quran is actually in Surah Al-Qiyamah. Allah says, بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَن نُسَوِّيَ بَنَانَهُ after the, question, the human being question, how will how will bones be put back together? Allah says we will even perfect down to the finest detail fingertips, down to the fingertips. So the question was about jamr, and Allah replaced it with taswiyah, right? What's really amusing, amazing is the only other time jamr is mentioned in the surah is inna alina jamahu wa Quranahu. Bring the Quran together. Bring the Quran together, and it's a, there's a, a connection being drawn. Speaking of connections, just how. It's, Every joint has its place, has its size, has its function, has its angle in my hand, in my wrist. You can't take a rib bone and put it in my index finger, right? It doesn't fit. The same one who did that is the same one who put the design of a surah together. So every ayah fits. It's perfect. It, and its words are perfect. And when you, when you look at the Quran from that perspective, your entire exploration changes. You're not just saying, just get to the point. Mm -hmm. No, the details are the point. The details are where, you know, because otherwise this surah is about akhirah. This surah is also about akhirah. Oh, that one? Akhirah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> this is all about the same thing. But when, you, yeah. but when you see the individual, because that, that's like saying, going into a gallery and saying, this painting, yellow, green, and blue, that painting, almost the same colors. Oh, no, but they're a painting. They're, look at the art. Bro, you're just thinking it's canvas and paint. But you're you're skipping the entire artistry. That's like saying a beautiful piece of jewelry is just metal. 
You there's there are there's artists. That's like saying the 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 BMW and the Audi and the Porsche and the Hyundai and then the 1987 whatever are just metal and there's an artistry, there's a design, there's a mm-hmm. mechanism, there's yeah. engineering. You're 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 you're, you're it's reductionist. reductionist. It's reductionist. Oh, and so we have this reductionist view of the Quran, mm-hmm. and we we we're, we're so offended when others are reductionists. We're we're doing it ourselves, mm. right? So, <coughs> the connections within the Quran, uh, within the Surah, actually are extremely telling. They're extremely extremely informative, and they they make you appreciate and give you an awe of the of the way Allah has crafted His Word for us. Well, yeah, for the on. record, this is the one contribution I give. This is my connection. To yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's helped so much with the with Nabla, mashallah, especially with the the, the sequence. No, and I, I I look at as you know, I look at sequence in three ways, yes. or you know, the linear, the anchors, uh, even the anchors. I've now in, evolved a little bit. I call them echoes and anchors. So echoes are the almost exact word being repeated, yeah. mm-hmm. like insan, mm-hmm. insan, ila rabbika yawma idhin, ila rabbika yawma idhin. Yeah. Okay, those are echoes, and then. Anchors are similar idea. Yeah. So there, there's a sort of a difference between Brings the two. Back. Yeah. Yeah. So the other the other lens is general lessons, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip that, and I'll let people go online. And then the last one, because this will transition to everything else. Yeah. And this is probably the one, and we I want to start. Usually you start with it, but I brought it last because it kind of ties it all together. Language. So this is what I mean. I think your famous your mantra was uh, MAGA, make Arabic great again, and you're the original <laughs> proponent of that. So Wait, you said that? I no. didn't. I'm pretty sure I didn't. <laughs> and if I did, I disown this. <laughs> disavow any original MAGA. But anyway, uh, so you're very big on looking at Allah's word choice. So Allah could have you and like, Tafsi is very big on saying like. So you're asking about Jannah. He may say like Allah takes them away, and then he'll be like a adab punishment. Like uh, it just means punishment. Right. And like over here, a qab a adab punishment. And then yeah. one punishment. Yeah. So all yeah. these yeah. synonyms for the same word get used up. It's like ah, same, 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 same. Yeah. But you're very big on saying like, no, I think there's a significance to that. You're not the only one, but you make that a very prominent point of your discussions. So why is that, and why is that significant? Why can't we just say synonyms? Same, same. So I think uh, word choice is one component of language. Um, word choice, sequence, rhetorical devices. Um, uh, uh, repetitions, brevity. Why is he being so brief? Why is he being more detailed here? Um, why is he repeating himself here? Why, uh, like you said, why are synonyms being used? Why not the other synonym to be used? These are all language-related questions, right? And I was fascinated with, with the language of the Quran. And a lot of people just see me as the language guy with Quran. But I would say language is actually the key to open all the other doors. And it's not the end, it's the beginning. The language is like, to me, it's like the first step. If I was to say, okay, so somebody asked me, what's your what's your process with the surah? Like what's step by step? What would you do? I would say I'd first identify the key words in that surah and really dig into the etymology, the origin of those words. So um, really understand the richness of the words being used by Allah in this surah. I take that out of, take that off my plate first. Get uh, really address that first. Then I would try to understand the internal mechanism logic of this surah, and I would use knowledge of that etymology as part of what's going to inform this discussion, right? Because it may not be as obvious if I didn't do that. So sometimes, you know, jama uh, uh, and jama is very obvious, right? But uh, people wouldn't make a connection between words like fujur and suda, but I would because now I looked at the etymology. So there's a subtle undercurrent between the two that brings the two words together, right? So doing that homework first is now, and, and, and from a principle, traditional point of view, Allah says, بِلِسَانٍ in Arabian mubin. So the attribute given to the language is the same attribute given to the Qur'an itself, as if to say, Qur'an mubin, lisan mubin. So the same mubin is being used. Clear, yeah. So clear and clarifying. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, to, to really get to the clarity of the Qur'an, you must be humble to the clarity of the language of the Quran. So I, 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 that's kind of my first steps in any surah. Uh, and then on top of that, I build my the, the study of tafsir, the basic tafsir, um, which is, is its own kind of endeavor. And on top of all of that, I build a repository of my unanswered questions. 
if I was a non-Muslim reading this, what would be my questions? Mm -hmm. When a mushrik was reading this, in a, listening to this in Mecca, what mm -hmm. were they thinking? How were they processing this? I won't answer it. I'll just tell you, like, when you hear, La uqsimu. No, I swear. Right? If Abu Jahl was listening to that, what would he think? Mm -hmm. who, who, who's the I? And I swear. He'd think it's the Prophet. But when I listen to it, as a Muslim, and I hear, La uqsimu, who am I thinking it is? It's Allah. No. So now there's two very different deliberately intended audiences by Allah. He intended the non-believer to think at the time, this is the Prophet talking. And he intended later generations to think this is Allah talking. And with two very different consequences and impacts. And now those impacts deserve study. Right? So, mm -hmm. that, but that's all built on top of language. So, um, so to me, language is, I don't know what I would have done without it. I honestly, I don't. I don't think I could have had the connection with the Quran that I do, uh, and certainly etymology is a big part of that, the origins of words, but it's not the only part. It's the the more I'm studying Balagha, the more um, the more I'm realizing that I there's being rhetoric, yeah, rhetoric and rhetorical devices and um, drawing from Arabic literature. What's really interesting now is I was talking to Dr. Sohib Saeed, who you're so lucky he lives. Uh, not oh, sorry, Dr. Saqib Hussain lives here. Yes, in LA. Uh, he's in LA. Uh, I was just talking to him yesterday, and he's like, You know, we have unearthed such a huge repository of Jahili poetry that is going to completely transform our look at dictionaries. And I was like, Tell me more. And there's a there's a, apparently a Doha database of uh, Jahili poetry, which you can search etymologically. So now finding the poems that had the words that are in the Qur'an, pre-Islam, and you can date which, how much before Islam. And then the, the hard part, how do you analyze the poem itself to draw from it? Mm -hmm. And how can that inform our, our reading of that word? So exciting. That's big nerd stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's big nerd stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Look how excited he is. <laughs> yeah, I got to go. No, manuscript's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, just, I, I have to, it, the thing is I geek out, Right? Yeah. And then I'm like, but I got to talk to 10 year olds. Yeah. yeah. And so I have, I'm constantly in this tension. When I geek out too much, then I'll, I got to do a story night or something. I got to really <coughs> bring it. You yeah. know, bring it's it. Because yeah, yeah. that's what Quran is it's it's tadkira, it's tadabur, it's. And you're actually yeah. building people at the story night. That's where yeah. a lot of the building of, uh, of people is. Just curious, happening. make yeah. them curious. Yeah. 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 I, I think I can end this topic at least on there. Uh, I appreciate the look at one khutbas and where those are headed. Yeah. Uh, Bay Institute, your view for it, and also like on a practical level, how we can approach the Quran at least to have that personal connection because it's one thing to hear someone else talk about the Quran, but now we need to take the initiative ourselves and, you know, read it for our yeah. own benefit and think like, okay, what did, besides, I have the tafsir notes here. What can, how does that apply to me today, tomorrow, forever? Even, even mm -hmm. my students, I tell them like, Read the translation first. Try to make sense of it first. Do you have a specific Struggle translation you you like to um, advise people to For read? Surah Yusuf, I like mine and Sahib's. We did that one at least. <laughs> uh, Abdul Halim is still kind of a go-to for me. Abdul Halim was concerned with the flow of the text. Yes. So he overlooked the nuances of the text. Okay. And he's just trying to get the overall sense, which is one of one legitimate way of attempting to translate the Quran. Okay. Those, like when I struggle to identify the nuances, then the language, the flow of the language becomes clunky. Yeah. Because you're chop, 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 you're stopping, 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 thinking, 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 and you're, it, the, it doesn't flow, right? Yeah. So translation is this constant tension between the, the individual components and the overall sense. So to get a really good, gra well read, like he, he consult consulted Ibn Ashur Razi, he looked mm -hmm. at the literary tafsir, and then he's like, okay, you know what? The literary sense that comes from this ayah Here's my aggregate conclusion of that. Okay. Right. So in that sense, I really do like uh, his translation. What do you see for Baina beyond your death? Like where does Baina Institute lie? Like what does Baina carry on beyond? I'm really excited about uh, Which, the, the legacy to leave behind it. Baina. my, I did some calculating my own study of the Quran and the, the deeper look series, which to me is my life project. Um, we're about 12 to 15 years from completion. If I, if, if I continue to stay on this full-time trajectory, yeah. that's a 12 to 15 year old uh, year project. There's about 380 pages of the Quran that I still need to cover in the Deeper Look series. Mm -hmm. um, 
So one of the mm-hmm. things, and, and other, other visions of Bayina kind of emanate from that. I want to be able to leave a resource behind in the study and appreciation of the Qur'an that becomes a stepping stone for future generations to take the exploration of the Qur'an to just new heights. So I become not the climax, but the first step to some, to, I, I want to help towards a renaissance in Qur'anic education. You know, and if I could have a small contribution, but you know, I can have a small piece of that, then life well lived, you know. Um, and I, I, I am already seeing the fruits of that emerge as I engage in this project because I could have just sat behind a camera. It would be so much cheaper. Stay at home, turn the camera on, talk about a surah. But the, the, the Quran week thing, going to Stuttgart, going to Scotland, going to Minnesota, going to Jersey, going to Florida, et cetera. It's a toll on me, toll on the family, expensive. Why am I doing it? Because everywhere I've gone, it seems like young people and old alike, they get re-engaged with the study and exploration of the Qur'an and it becomes a starting point for them, which is so exciting to see. So there's stuff we're doing online and then there's kind of this a groundswell happening literally on the ground yeah. with, with Qur'an exploration. So that's really, really exciting to me. The, the, the overall vision of Bayina is I want to leave behind one, resources. Two, I want to be able to leave behind a Qur'an, eventually a Qur'an seminary uh, archive. So like if somebody asked, I want a bachelor's degree in Qur'anic studies. If somebody okay. hypothetically asked that question, what would that be made of? What courses would it have? And do we have a list of those courses? And how would those courses work with each other? And have we developed that, that course material? Have we taught that course material? And is it available? Like lynda.com, like, you know, those other educational institutions that you yeah. can take a course. I want to be able to take, courseify Quran education beyond the tafsir. But somebody that takes a step back and says, I want to actually, at an institutional level, mm-hmm. study the Quran. Because after serving the madaris and seeing that Quran, like an ijazah in Quran studies, or a degree, a shahada in Quran studies, isn't really there, not really. Then we could do something about that. Uh, and, and that's kind of one of the longer term visions. The The final piece of this is I want to be able to um, develop publications um, and materials that and and hopefully when Bayina grows enough, two areas, uh, creative and research mm-hmm. that actually outlive what I'm doing. So instead of the Bayina, goal of Bayina is to produce the next uh, speaker, no, the goal of being is to produce the next wave of exploration into the Qur'an. And I want to be able to, inshallah, grow the organization to the point where there's an endowment and there's a, there's a self-funding mechanism by which people that are studying, uh, you know, neuroscience, people that are studying quantum physics mm-hmm. uh, can be in conversation at symposia, at, you know, well-organized forums they can be in conversation with leading Quranic studies scholars on spe- specific heavy-handed issues, mm. right? And to be able to create a forum for those to continue going. Because I don't think the future is in individual contributions. I think the future is in collaborative contributions. And so to give you an example, the famous ayah of uh, hitting women, right? Dr. Saqib wrote a paper on hitting women. My idea was, okay, one day, Bayina will have a symposium where uh, divorce attorneys, social workers, people that survived abusive uh, marriages, uh, uh, fuqaha, muhaddithin, on every end of the spectrum. The the scholars that say beat with a toothbrush or people that say don't leave a mark or people that say it's all good, green light, just go and it's it's the UFC or people that say, no, this is, we're misreading it. People, let's have a rereading of it. Let's have everybody on the table. Let's debate and hash this out because it affects millions of lives. Right. This ayah alone can affect millions and millions of lives, right? Mm-hmm. So let's take his paper and let people rip into it. Let's see see where their criticisms are coming, coming from, what their evidences are, and let the public be an audience to that. Let the public see that this debate is actually happening because Sunni, the Sunni narrative so far, at least in our age, most of it is talking at people instead of talking to people, Right. You'll say something, then somebody will write something or say something about what you said instead of talking to you, mm-hmm. right? And of course, uh, the social media world has enhanced that. So podcasts are one thing, but then you do something and then somebody writes a, makes a video essay about what you've done, 
and then they make a video essay, essay about that video essay or whatever. Like this has become yeah. a thing. It's the new age, like React, PDF uh, refutation. This is the new age of PDF refutation. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but I want to I want to be able to bring uh, that that that's that that mechanism back to actual discussion. Also, the curriculum, right? The the K through twelve curriculum. You had mentioned that earlier. K through twelve. I want to revolutionize yeah. Arabic education. Yeah. Yeah. I want to automate Arabic education. So I want I want to compete with or outdo uh, what Duolingo is able to do with mm-hmm. languages for Quranic Arabic. Okay. And I want to put a system behind it so that, because the curriculum is already there, put a system behind it so that universities around the world, institutions, Islamic schools, or end users can actually use that as a platform to say, okay, we can we can track exactly how much Arabic our students know, how much they can grasp, how much ahead they have to go. Like we can put actual systems behind that. Okay. Right? And... Uh, and the more we can automate that, the more we can like perfect that, we can actually create a new standard for Quranic Arabic education around the world. And then the same thing I want to do with actually Quranic vocabulary or you know Quran comprehension, Quran con- conceptual co- comprehension based on each age group. And so I want to see Bayina be at the forefront of creative, academic, and tech. Those are the three that I want to be able to kind of explore new territories. And Alhamdulillah, the team is really great right now. And Amazing. we have um, really, really inspired, uh, very driven people that are that are, that are are trying to take this to the next level. And the, the kind of support that, uh, you know, we're getting internationally. So here in the U.S., Alhamdulillah also, because uh, the, even the, the LA experience was here was so great. It was just so great. I'm and, really happy to hear that. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. I really enjoyed it. And... Even pre all of this mess, I had a bad opinion of LA. And I'll tell you why. I, I thought of LA as lazier than the rest of America. Like y'all are too laid back. Eh, nobody's too serious over here. This is just chilling. Yeah, there's an event, but it's like 40 minutes. I don't know. I want to go. Like that's, that's kind of the, that's how I saw LA for years when I used to come here. Yeah, not that far off. So, <laughs> but I was shocked. People were driving an hour, hour and a half, two hours to attend every single night, three hours. And asking the most amazing questions and like it was it was really cool. It was a really great experience and old and young and just it was just really it was it was a very beautiful experience. I'll I'll be sure to repeat it. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Well, that's a good note. Inshallah. Also, we're really approaching time. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, with that, this is Ahmad Mabruk with the Prophetic Mentality Podcast signing off. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Wa barakatuh.